And thank you so much to Sound and Vision and IDFA and MIT Open Documentary Lab uh, for this great invitation. I think, I feel like there could be literally uh, hundreds of people that could have had this slot today. And I really want to honor all the people who have made interactive documentaries and immersive works and all this old, new, old slash relevant media in the last 20 years. Um, and it was really a pleasure to hear Casper um, reflect on, on the last 15, 15 years or so. And I remember 2007 so well. And I also remember the year before that in 2006, when we launched um, Filmmaker in Residence, which we consider the world's first uh, feature length documentary, flash-based RIP. Um, and uh, that was at IDFA. And we didn't really know how to do it, but we, we tried our best and we, we organized our launch for the documentary um, at IDFA. And then we were so grateful to come back to IDFA uh, on invitation of Casper and begin really developing our next big project called High Rise. And Casper um, was instrumental in some of um, engaging in some of uh, the latest technologies of the time that we ended up weaving into the first project of High Rise. So Casper, I want to thank you for that leadership and um, great vision back then. It really is a long time ago. Um, and today I'm just gonna go through um, some of my thoughts on High Rise and hopefully uh, I'm speaking from personal experience as an artist working on High Rise, but I'm hoping to highlight, I think what are some of the key issues in terms of uh, what makers think about in terms of uh, looking back at our work. I know there is uh, there are different points of view on it. Some people like Brett Gaylor just say, forget about it, 401, let's just move on. Um, so I just wanna honor that there is that point of view. I, am, I do not hold that perspective. I believe history is important um, and it's, uh, history is an opportunity for us to engage with uh, the past, the present, and the future. So um, for me, uh, this is a huge honor to see so many people at this event today um, uh, who, are, who are actively engaged in, in this very, very important question of how, how to um, uh, keep memory of, of our internet lives. Um, I also, one last point I wanted to mention uh, what Casper says is this is the time to love the web again. I think we went through a period of, of this work that really kind of did disconnect from, from our web lives and here we are back again in front of our screens, whether we like it or not, and with a billion, you know, billions of people around the world. So this, this is the moment, uh, truly. I'm just going to take a moment to um, uh, share my screen and uh, insert the presentation. How long do I have, Rasa? I just don't want to go over your schedule. So uh, you have 25 minutes for the presentation and five for questions. Okay, great. I'll try and be a little bit shorter just to, to get you back on schedule. That's I do that. I'll, I'll, I'll work towards that. So um, again, I'll, I'm going to focus on a project called High Rise, which was um, a project the National Film Board of Canada um, that uh, we, we uh, really spent seven years of our lives doing. And um, it really is a, a plethora of many different interventions, uh, always centered around a digital documentary, but many, many other kinds of interventions. And um, we were really honored to be recognized uh, around the world by quite a few audiences and um, critical, uh, critical coverage. Um, and, and like I said, there are many different uh, types of interventions, some local and some more global. Local meaning Toronto here in Canada, which is where I'm based, even though I'm uh, working with the MIT Open Documentary Lab, Sarah Wallison and uh, Dr. William Enrico. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so this is just like a little picture of uh, the timeline from 2008 when we launched, even though we started back in 2007. Uh, to research uh, all the way to 2015. And uh, the projects spanned um, many different kinds of things, including live installations, um, a lot of participatory projects, uh, formal academic relationships with uh, large teams of scholars around specifically geography and uh, um, suburban, suburban questions and digital questions. So uh, the way I'm going to organize my reflection on this large project is uh, by four uh, kind of categories, by story, by platform and technology, by assets and by process. So just to give you a sense of the kinds of stories and the kinds of um, 
uh, questions we were asking, uh, both uh, scholarly questions, but also um, social questions, political questions, artistic questions. Um, we had five, uh, five main documentaries um, out my window, which uh, included about 80 minutes of material and then four others that were a little bit smaller universe within the last one that was made in um, collaboration with MIT Open Documentary Lab. Um, it was a bit longer again. Um, so I'll just give you a sense of um, what each of these, not some of these projects look like, just to give you a sense of the content of the material. This is... Desde mi ventana, eh, por la mañana me gusta pararme y ver el mar. También me gusta, según como este día, ver el mar, llegarme hasta Bolivia. So that just gives you a sense of uh, that flash-based project. Uh, and this is the last one. So this is Universe Within. <laughs> rises are a kind of metaphor for the way we live today, physically together, but very much apart. You shut the door to your apartment and connect to the world through the internet. In my apartment, I have a laptop, my iPhone, a table, and three chairs. Sometimes I picture the internet as a spider web and all these little bugs trying to get out. It was made in 2015, but it kind of feels like 2020. This is my apartment, my table, my chair, my internet connection, and it's all I do. It's, <laughs> it, it was a little bit weird to pull out that clip and see it today. Um, and here's just a touch of- The new luxury high rise places are getting smarter, greener, taller, while the new low rent trend downtown is to make the units smaller and smaller and smaller. There's a partnership with the New York Times. There were all sorts of kinds of interventions that users were invited to participate in. Game, game five feature. Rise really looked at uh, the intersection of um, density, urban density, and digital lives. And that was the central thesis, and it was refracted in a kaleidoscope of, of projects um, and stories uh, with many, many different kinds of partners around the world. Um, and in terms of platforms and technologies, uh, we, you know, this is the long list, Flash, of course, uh, but many others, including APIs from, uh, you know, now defunct platforms or near defunct platforms like Flickr, um, Yahoo Weather, uh, we used uh, Google Street View as APIs in one of our participatory projects, a lot of user generated content, um, DepthKit, of course, who are now the leaders in volumetric, um, uh, volumetric uh, cinematography and uh, all sorts of other early early versions of technologies that now create uh, are the foundation of, of a lot of the immersive work that we see today. Um, we also used a lot of um, outside the browser uh, technologies like um, touch developer uh, as, a, as a VJ kind of uh, technology, live performances. We also went back to some legacy forums, including radio and print. We had partnerships with New York Times, with Wired.com, with um, Globe and Mail, uh, The Atlantic, uh, multi multiplicity of, uh, of uh, print publications and their digital, digital uh, sisters. Um, 
this is just gives you some of the examples. This is uh, the WebGL work, uh, which created a 3D environment within the browser. This is the pioneering 360 tech um, that uh, Casper invited us to uh, work with. This is a Dutch company using the Google Cam, um, uh, but uh, running it at uh, 24 frames per second. Um, here we are using the Connect uh, camera uh, or technology with our host in a live presentation of the launch of Universe Within. Um, this is an installation. Uh, this is a three hour, this was one of the most powerful, I think, um, interventions of High Rise in which we had a three hour remote radio broadcast with a very popular morning host in the city to talk about some of the, um, th that broadcast directly out of the high rise we were working in. Um, and so then by assets, and I think, again, these are the, these are so many of the projects that we're talking about today um, involve many, many different kinds of assets, tens of thousands of photographs. We had completed, not, you know, over 90 shorty, short films. Um, and then, of course, the 360 collages, like large, large format scale um, uh, photographs, 360 films, uh, lots of journalism, so text, a lot of articles, um, many academic articles, including some uh, book that just came out last month, um, uh, subway posters, uh, human profiles, and stories from 40 plus cities. So a lot of, you know, and each project, you know, I think could, could kind of organize their, their materials in this way as well. Um, and then uh, finally by process, which is really what I'm most concerned with as an artist, and especially now working at the co-creation studio at Open Documentary Lab, I'm really fascinated by uh, the process and how do we document, memorialize, and engage, continue to engage with the things kind of behind the scenes, behind the products. Um, the citizens felt the need for uh, better communication. Refer to some of them. But the established the media are method. not accessible um, to ordinary people, there's a lot of especially up, the poor. Uh, documentation, we therefore asked ourselves uh, this question. Involved. What could Very happen if the people had people the technology of communication in their own reasons. hands? Um, it's community it's impact, educational components and partnerships. And those seem like dry, boring part of uh, maybe an incredible documentary. Uh, but for us, those are really crucial elements of how, how we did this work. Um, and then, so I guess it lands us on what actually remains. What are the, what are the artifacts, so to speak? Um, and on the web, we still have a WordPress site, highrise.nfb.ca that links us to all the various sites. Again, two, uh, one of them in High Rise is Flash, so we were really concerned about that one, and we're thrilled to be working with, um, with Eleni at Sound and Vision about that, uh, to find other ways of documenting that when Flash uh, disappears. Um, uh, a big portion of, of High Rise, the short history of High Rise, um, is on the New York Times site, so we don't even um, you know, that's held by an entirely different organization. We have some documentation on GitHub. So some of our developers uh, took the time to document there, which we consider, and many, many artists that I've spoken to and that we've spoken to at Open Documentary Lab consider this a crucial part of the documentation uh, and the memory, living memory. Um, we have two books. Um, one was uh, um, in 2019, which was a, a book uh, created for a youth audience. So taking some of those stories and reformatting them with a lot of educational material. Um, so it's a lovely book. And then the second book is, uh, is an academic um, exploration. It was really actually alongside a universe within, uh, made over literally seven or eight years. It's a beautiful collection of, of essays and, and contemplations and field work. Um, on the documentary side, we've got Do DocuBase, and we're going to hear from Sarah Wallazen, the founder of DocuBase, on that. Um, we have, of course, uh, our collective wisdom field study um, that we published uh, last year at Open Documentary Lab. Um, it's a field study of 166 artists and projects around the world, and we, we managed to talk a little bit about High Rise in there, um, and certainly the spirit of that, you know, those processes. So we document uh, co-creative um, process within community, across organizations, um, with various types of technologies, including artificial intelligence, and those are all the kinds of interventions we certainly um, engaged with in high rise. A lot of press, some scholarship, 
Um, and then uh, archiving, we have, of course, the National Film Board of Canada that has an extensive uh, archiving um, agenda and process, but that's really for film. So a lot of the work there is involves just um, you know, keeping keeping our hard drives, and in some cases, you know, the the of course the completed films as well as the assets. Uh, but I think um, they're still working through some of these huge, large questions as well. Um, and we're really, as I mentioned, really excited to uh, to do a walk through a sound and vision and and um, use that as another way of perhaps getting more at the artistic and um, emotional and dramaturgical. Uh, sort of history of the project that sometimes is lost in, in these other things that remain. Um, so I'm just gonna... The citizens forward. felt the need. I think, yeah, so, uh, so I guess that's, that's where I'm gonna leave this. Um, how might the legacy of High Rise as a whole? So what is the, the, the greater thing uh, than something just the sum of its parts. How can that be accessible to future audiences? Um, and can it be done as a creative act? And um, I speak from High Rise, but I think I speak for, for many uh, in, in the making community and certainly uh, people in this uh, call today. So I'll leave it there and um, Rasa uh, will open to questions. Is that cool? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kat, for such a wonderful presentation. And I would very much encourage everyone who has not seen the project uh, yet to check it out as well. It's really amazing. Uh, we already have uh, at least one question from the chat from uh, Yesse. Um, it says, uh, would an approach uh, to archive um, the project be simply to archive separate assets? Um, to make it available for future interpretations. Uh, and I would also add uh, how, how could we actually make and kind of document the co connections between those assets. That's the question. I think um, <clears throat> definitely the National Film Board of Canada has done a remarkable job um, holding its assets of, of, of all its films and media uh, in its remarkable, I think, 80-year history now. Um, uh, but the question remains for me as a maker that it's that the project is something greater than the sum of its parts. Is this question? Uh, so how do we how do we you know archive the assets and then make those accessible, but then also make the connections that we made creatively uh, through platforms that are no longer available. <laughs> So that's that's kind of the the tension, um, and it was already a difficult project. I mean, we certainly got a lot of questions, even at NFB, about because it was such a sprawling project. It had so many different. It was a big octopus, and it had so many different tentacles, and different elements to it. And I think many of these works are there are experiments, there are in multiple interventions, multiple iterations, and some of these. You know, you, when you see a film, you you sit down and you watch the film from zero to ninety minutes, and that is the experience but in this project we were challenged by the nfb well you know what is what is the true high-rise experience is it is it watching every single project that we ever did attend all our live presentations and listen to our three-hour radio program and it's you know that's the question what is the true high-rise experience you know and we always argued even if somebody just engages with the concept of a digital life intersected with a uh, with a with an urban or suburban one, that's already for us an important, you know, uh, engagement with the high rise project. So, you know, if it was hard in the present at the time, imagine, you know, how do we look at back at that through a succinct historical archive? And I, I'm not sure what the answer is. Thank you so much. I think we're still all looking for the answer. That's why we're all here today. Um, I have one more question. As, as an artist, uh, not only talking about the high-rise project, uh, do you consider questions of digital preservation and preservation in general during your creative process at all? Uh, is it something more of an aftermath thought or, or are you more conscious of this and try to consider these considerations from the beginning? 
Um, I was phenomenally lucky because uh, the senior producer on High Rise, Jerry Flahive, um, who was an incredibly experienced uh, producer at the NFB, was always thinking about that question. And so the way that he, you know, helped devise the IP um, contracts with all our partners, uh, the consent forms, um, all those questions he was really considering. And that really is the benefit of working in an agency like the National Film Board of Canada that is tasked with, you know, the archive question already embedded within it. Like when you're working with the NFB as a Canada's public producer, you already have that question posed to you uh, from the get-go. Um, but that's not to say that there weren't incredible challenges, of course. Um, and, you know, how do we uh, how do we deal with technologies that break even as we're trying to launch the project? I mean, these are not complete platforms. They're, they're evolving and, and they're disappearing. So definitely, um, you know, trying to steer a boat and empty out the water and plug the hole at the same time. <laughs>